my name's Toby Marshall, and I'll be your uh, chair this morning. Uh, and I'm an A-level teacher of uh, communications and uh, philosophy and film, uh, many other things. Um, so we're here today to um, debate uh, the uh, politics of uh, multiculturalism. And I don't propose to say a great deal uh, by way of introduction to this, um, because we've got such a great panel uh, to take us um, through the uh, issues. I mean, two things in particular, and I'll restrict my comments to that, that I'm interested in, uh, is what do we mean by um, diversity? Are we, all, are we really um, diverse, as often said in the discussion? Uh, what is the extent of that uh, diversity and what do we mean by that? And then, if indeed we are a, uh, diverse uh, uh, as, a, as a society, uh, how should we orient ourselves towards that diversity? Uh, should we respect it? Should we coexist with it? Um, or should we um, celebrate it? So they're things that I'd like to um, get out of the uh, discussion today, and I'm sure many other things will, will emerge. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I'll just say a little bit uh, about the format. Um, our speakers are going to introduce for up to um, uh, seven minutes. We'll then have a brief uh, panel discussion, but really I'm keen to, uh, as quickly as possible, get out to the floor for people to make as many comments, points, and uh, rants as they see, see fit. Uh, then I'll bring the panel back to um, comment on those, uh, and then we'll go back out, and in, in the end, people, uh, speakers will uh, summate for a minute. Um, so I'll just introduce my speakers, and we'll go straight out to them. Um, uh, and speaking in this audio, I'm going to keep it very, very brief. There's lots more details uh, on the, the website for them. <coughs> speaking uh, first to my immediate right is uh, Rania Hafez. Um, she's the founder and director of uh, Muslim Women in Education, and she's the chair of the Standing Committee for the Education um, and Training of Teachers, and she'll be our first uh, speaker. Uh, to my far right, uh, Dr. Jonathan Chaplin. He's the director of the Kirby Lang Institute for Christian Ethics um, at Cambridge um, and author of uh, Multiculturalism, uh, Christian Retrieval, which I've recently finished and I, I recommend highly for a very clear uh, uh, outline of the, the, the issues associated with um, uh, multiculturalism. To my far left <coughs> is um, James Martin Erickson. Um, he's a writer, he's a playwright, and he's a novelist, uh, and he's also co-author uh, of uh, a very interesting publication called The Democratic Contradictions of uh, Multiculturalism. Um, so he'll be our third speaker. And then finally to my left uh, is uh, Max Wynne Cowell. And um, Max is head of the Progressive Conservatism Project at Demos, uh, an author of a, a Place of Pride and Are We There Yet? Um, a collection of uh, essays on race and conservatism. So they'll be our speakers. So uh, our speakers will be speaking for between five and seven um, minutes. And um, please prepare your questions, points, um, as they're speaking. Um, Run it. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Um, I think the issue of I mean, so the issue of multicultural is very complex and has many nuances. And I'm not going to. I don't propose to give you a lecture on multiculturalism, but I think there are some questions that we need to raise, and Toby's already raised some of them about diversity. Uh, he, Toby asked, are we all diverse? Well, actually, yes, we are. You know, just looking around this room, we can see that we are very different. But I want to propose that this diversity is a very personal one, and to actually be defined by it in a formal political sense is the problem that we have faced. Uh, London is a very cosmopolitan city. You just have to go out there, and uh, I can ask any of you, you know, what you've eaten, and I'm sure it would be things like pasta, hummus, and uh, enchiladas, a variety of foods from different cultures, but uh, is that enough to actually define us as individuals? I've seen, uh, just using myself as an example, I'm sure you, you look at me and you see a woman with a headscarf and all sorts of stereotypes go through your head, um, you, rightly or wrongly, that's fine, that's not a problem. But when these things become more formalised, that's when the issue arises. Um, the problem with multicultural is not the multicultural itself, we are very different, is actually the policies, the, the formalization of multiculturalism, the, the, the racialization of individuals in a formal uh, state kind of supported way, uh, that actually emphasized differences and created more problems than, than purported to, to solve. Um, and I know some of you will argue that we needed a multicultural approach to deal with issues of racism, and some academics have even argued it's to do with colonial legacy. Uh, but then I, I actually 
would argue that this was already uh, too far gone and, and uh, to actually start blaming colonialism at this point in time is a bit spurious. So what I want to do is highlight what I think are the problems of multiculturalism uh, in, a, in a formal way that we have, and I'm sure a lot of you would, and some colleagues on the panel will argue with me. Um, as I said, many, many issues with, with multiculturalism, not least what is culture, how do we define it? I'll leave it to you to maybe come up with ideas about how do we define culture. But the, the, main, the first one is that it caricatures the individual and groups. It reduces individuals to uh, a set of stereotypes that belong formally to a group as defined by, by the state and by policies. So um, it leads to what somebody called the Disneyfication of culture. It takes away the uh, inherent complications, contradictions within different uh, groups that, that, that may exist and it reduces them to kind of headlines that are um, um, anodyne, that are harmless and we can all accept and uh, you know, will be tied anybody who tries to actually bring any complexity into this. And it also takes away the agency of the individual. Suddenly, I am a Muslim woman, therefore everybody seems to, uh, to presume they know what a Muslim woman stands for. And I've had this uh, issue when somebody suggested that a, a panel should have a, a woman with a headscarf on it to represent all Muslim women. Uh, and I find that absolutely insulting, that the idea that anybody who puts a headscarf on would represent my ideas um, is reducing me to really caricature of what I could be. So that's the first problem with multicultural uh, approaches, formal multicultural approaches. Another one, and that's one that I've um, kind of discovered in, in my personal professional life, and I still see, is a deficiency model of so-called ethnic minorities. As soon as we use the term minority and ethnic minority, somehow it carries with it the idea that the, the people who belong to these minorities have something wrong with them. They're deficient, they're like children. Uh, they are perpetual victims and somehow the state needs to step in and protect them. And I, I actually have issues with that because it does infantilize um, the other. It others the other and then infantilize the other. And it takes away the idea that individuals are responsible for their own destiny and making choices and somehow the state has to step in and be their guardian. And there's a variety of acts and, and uh, uh, formal, um, whether regional, local, or, or national uh, measures that, that, that actually uh, reflect that. Uh, the third one um, is a relativist approach. And that means that uh, because of the policies of multiculturalism, we have to accept everything without any questions. You do not question anything. Everybody's entitled to their cultural uh, uh, practices. However, some of us may find them obnoxious. And I know there are other debates about the fact that currently that we are arguing with things like the burqa or uh, I don't know, feed binding, or it doesn't exist anymore. But that's the. But broadly, if you go, if you work in any organisation, you'll find that uh, should you attempt to even question anything, um, you know, the, the um, HR or, or the equality people in your organisation will come down like a brick. So there is. This has brought with it the idea that you have to, have to have to accept whatever everybody claims as a culture without any judgment and you're not allowed to give offence. So, the, and this in itself is an insult to individuals and groups. The idea that you, they're not capable of discussing their, their norms, their values and actually withstanding strong debate. Uh, and that shuts down engagement. So we are all multicultural, all different, but guess what, we can't talk about the difference, lest we give offence. Uh, and last but not least, I mean there are other problems, but again another one I've seen is the racialization of issues and problems. So you might have issues in terms of the workforce engagement or achievement in education and suddenly we reduce them to racial stereotypes of why certain groups are achieving or not achieving. And I was recently at a seminar uh, by the Governors Equalities Unit and that was very much the issue. Suddenly it's, uh, you know, uh, black boys um, uh, or, you know, white working class boys, and I know there are statistics there, but we, it stops people actually delving behind the statistics and accepting a very reduced cultural ex ex um, explanation of these things. And it, it actually racializes the, the, um, the issues we have. And what happens is that it ends up with Racism, a new form of racism, as somebody uh, named it laundered racism, promoted by the anti-racists who are trying to address these problems. So I put it to you that 
these are five of the main problems we have with formalized multiculturalism. And I leave it to my colleagues on the panel and yourself to come back and see whether you agree or disagree with me. Thank you very much, Rania. Um, Jonathan. Thank you. Well, uh, I agree with a great deal of what Rani has just said, but I want to give a, a rather more positive account of multiculturalism. Um, this is interesting to too. So here I'm sitting next to a Muslim woman <laughs> who who's criticizing multiculturalism. I'm a Christian white male middle class professional uh, in favor. Make what you will of that. Um, so I want to do so against, consciously against the stream of current public and elite opinion where for the last decade multiculturalism has been persistently run down uh, and now the mantra multiculturalism causes segregation has become the dominant narrative and I think that's damaging. I don't think multiculturalism has had its day um, but it does need serious rethinking and reconceptualizing. The blurb says is it time for a more moderate multiculturalism? Uh, I would want to say I think it's time for a more discriminating multiculturalism and let me try and spell that out under two brief heads. Firstly, the justification of multiculturalism, and secondly, its, its application in various sorts of public policy. And I'll stay at a pretty general level here and get into the de uh, details in, in discussions. And firstly, at the level of justification, what is the basic justification for a multicultural approach to public policy? Well, as uh, René just pointed out, um, multiculturalism is frequently attacked as somehow implying or, or being premised on cultural relativism or moral relativism. And I understand that to mean this. There are many different versions of relativism, but the one I have in mind is simply this, that there are no valid grounds to criticize the beliefs and practices of other cultures or, or, other, or other faiths. There are no valid epistemological grounds for making those uh, moral judgments. And I find that this version of relativism both intellectually incoherent and also politically uh, disabling. It's politically disabling, and I think we'd agree on this, for example. Uh, to let me quote you the example of a, a younger Asian schoolgirl, Shazia Shafi, some years ago, who went missing from school for many months. Uh, teachers, social workers, and police did nothing about it. Eventually, a foreign office official, it turned out she was, had been forcibly returned, I think, to Pakistan uh, because she was becoming too Western. Uh, a foreign office official at the time was quoted as saying this. You can't force ideas on people who have held different ideas for generations. You don't know who is on the right side, and here's the killer, or even if there is a right side. That is moral relativism gone to seed, and it's hugely damaging. I want to propose that a credible multiculturalism, the kind I would uh, defend, can only be premised on a robust ethical universalism. In my view, everyone rightly and necessarily, unavoidably, invokes universal moral criteria when they engage in debates on issues like multiculturalism, forced marriage, faith schools, and so on and so forth. Even those who actually pretend to be cultural and moral relativists actually smuggle in universal criteria anyway. So let's be frank about this. We're all moral universalists. Let's have an open debate about what kind of universal values we wish to propose. And those universal values must apply not only to so-called minority cultures, but obviously to majority cultures, equally, so as not to appear to be invoked purely with a view to marginalizing or criticizing um, or stigmatizing members of minority cultures. Now, my universal convictions uh, derive from Christianity, a certain strand of, of Christianity. And from Christianity, I derive at least three principles which ground my approach to multiculturalism. The equal dignity of all individuals, irrespective of cultural background. Uh, the fact that individuals are nevertheless constituted partly and formed by their communal memberships. And thirdly, that ethnic and religious community memberships and, and identities are entitled to public recognition. So those are three broad principles of justification that I would derive, but from a, a universal vision of, um, of morality, not from a purely tribal um, invocation of a religious faith. So that's by way of justification, no to cultural relativism, yes to ethical universalism as the basis for a credible multiculturalism. Just briefly, areas of application now. Um, let me suggest that two public policy goals which remain defensible uh, in, in, with respect to multicultural 
of public policies. Firstly, substantive equality of treatment, and secondly, democratic inclusion. I, don't know, I'll make, I may get cut off before democratic inclusion, <laughs> in which case I'll have to bring it back in the discussion. Let's see how we get on. Substantive equality of, uh, of treatment. Pure, a purely formal or procedural equality of treatment thinks that you can secure justice by treating every individual identically. In many cases, that is true. Where we possess, rightly, universal civil rights or human rights, identical treatment is what is required. <coughs> but there are many other areas of justice where that, that outcome is not delivered by a purely formal application of <coughs> equal individual rights. Substantive equality, substantive equality of outcome, of result, may require differential treatment and even the differential distribution of particular rights. So let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, I'll see how many I get through before I get, I get cut off here. How am I doing? How many minutes have we got? Uh, you've got a minute. A minute. Okay, mm. all right. <coughs> if I can just read this. This is a public sector guidance document from the Equality and Human Rights Commission in 2009. And I'll just read this account. Provides uh, support for this view. Its specific concern was that an inflexible resistance to single group funding on the part of the state was putting at risk the funding of women-only services, such as those helping victims of domestic violence, including those catering to ethnic minority women. It asserted a fundamental principle, quote, an informed understanding of substantive equality aimed at reducing disadvantage, recognizes that people have different needs and that equality can be achieved sometimes by treating people differently. That's from uh, the oracle, the highest oracle in the country on multiculturalism, which is the Equality and Human Rights Commission, recognizing that differential treatment is sometimes necessary as a, as a, a mandate of justice. You give many other examples like that. And uh, let me just say one word or two words about democratic inclusion. I think multiculturalism, the kind of multiculturalism I want to favor, pulls against a secular Republican model of citizenship and the relation between the state and citizen, in which there is a binary divide between the universal state and discrete associated individuals construed as devoid of, divorced from their ethnic, religious, and many other identities. It seems to me that citizenship fully entitles us to present in the public realm a range of identities that are important to us and that inform our understanding of politics and democratic participation and citizenship. But it's perfectly legitimate to bring those identities to bear, both in democratic fora at various levels, and also to have those identities recognised in different ways in, in, in a, a range of public policy issues such as education, healthcare, housing, and so on and so forth. I would say a word about Sharia councils uh, but time's out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this one on? Is this one on? Yes. yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is James Martin here. Um, I'm a rice guy living in Copenhagen and Geneva. And uh, I've written this book, um, uh, actually, I have here, uh, The Democratic Contradictions on Multiculturalism, which is a field study from Malaysia. As, which is the uh, sort of uh, model country for hard, what we call hard multiculturalism, a very segregationist society, but nevertheless uh, a democracy and uh, with a rule of law. Um, and then there is an idea, uh, a description of the history of ideas and where did it all originate from the, uh, the whole idea of multiculturalism. The origins is from the American anthropology. And then there is a section about the um, interventions, uh, uh, no, about the, uh, the multicultural discourse, the way we discuss things uh, when it comes to multiculturalism. I will uh, present the um, sort of um, the way we talk about multiculturalism. It could be helpful maybe to, to step back and take a look at the way we actually discuss multiculturalism at least in the continental parts of Europe. Um, so I'll say something about the battle over symbols in Europe. Um, the director of the Trondheim Art Museum in Norway, um, Pontus Kianda, he has this summer conceived the idea that the Norwegian flag 
should no longer be used at his museum. He argues that the flag of a nation is no longer a collective symbol able to gather everybody in the country. According to the director, the flag, of, uh, on the contrary, has a function of exclusion. It gathers only ethnic religions, uh, Christian believers, and not the new inhabitants who has come to uh, arrive to the country with another faith. This director, Pontus Kianda, thereby has taken the battle over symbols in Europe yet another step forward. He could hardly have arrived to this idea if there was not something to it. So let's try to follow his way of thinking. Uh, what if he was right, and not only Norway, but also other European countries, fall apart in separate nations, no longer defined after territories, but after religious and moral values? In that sense, the original population lived with their own customs and norms, separated from others, Muslim immigrants, who inhabit a world of their own. Kianda's idea, then, is that other symbols for nationhood than the flag must be found, symbols more general, able to gather people across religion, ethnicity, culture, and nationality. Hereby, he's opening a discussion of what symbols means to multiculturalism. And let's remember multiculturalism, the most radical attempt to make possible for people to live in each their own world, religiously, culturally, linguistically, within the same political territory. Which is the symbol that may incarnate the values to keep such a community together? And what kind of community, if any, is left in a multiculturalist society where we no longer share culture, religion, nationality, nor language? <clears throat> this battle over symbols in Europe has intensified during recent years in the wake of multiculturalism. More and more demands are made in different countries by different groups so they could practice their own culture and customs and receive respect for special religious practices. To mention some examples, Muslim organizations may go so far as to demand special police uniforms for female officers, special opening hours for public swimming pools dedicated to exclusively Muslim women, special bathing curtains for Muslim boys to protect them from being exposed naked to other kids, special diets in schools and other institutions, special praying rooms, interpretation facilities in all public institutions, and offers for being taught the language of the original homeland. Such wishes for displaying symbols for one's separateness from society at large create animosity in many occasions, but they do not express anything but the wish to mark one's own identity and one's cultural and religious segregation from majority society. As it's well known, former French President Sarkozy uh, prohibited the wearing of burkas in France in 2010, along with the prohibition of uh, religious symbols. Switzerland, 2009, introduced a prohibition against the construction of minarets after a referendum. Also, many liberal Swiss citizens voted for this prohibition as a protest. They wished to object against what they saw as illiberal norms in the culture of the Muslim minority and force out in the open a debate about taboo subjects. There were only a few politicians in Switzerland and in the continent of Europe and the media dare to address the bigotry, what they see as the bigotry of some Muslim norms and their incompatibility to basic human rights the violent lesson animosity against homosexuals, the prohibition in, pra in practice for Muslim youth to outmarry from their community and meet a spouse from the non-Muslim majority. This is an issue that is never discussed. Um, that's, that's what they said in Switzerland when they asked the conservative people in the mountains, why did you, why did you vote for this? Uh, and uh, that was the reason why they voted. Um, the balance over symbol seems to be the way multiculturalism is discussed in Europe these years, where the new cultural nations like Muslims try to introduce new signs supporting their segregation, 
from the majority, then they are confronted with rigid and undemocratic counter-attacks. The democratic institutions react with a counter-strike when they pass laws to oppress the freedom of religion for Muslims and prohibit the symbols of their religious identity. The initiative from this director in Norway can be seen as an attack against these counter-attacks. He wants to deconstruct the most holy sign of the majority society, that it exists as a historical community beyond time. His allegation is that now it is just a, minority, a majority and nothing but a majority here now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I'm going to try to not speak for too long because, well, for a start, I think on quite a lot of the practice, we're in danger of having an outbreak of violent agreement amongst many of the panelists. So I, I don't actually think there are necessarily that many substantive differences. That's possibly because I have shallow thinking, whereas they have deep thinking. But I think on, uh, on lots of these questions, we're in, in, in some uh, accordance. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, from a conservative perspective, uh, why multiculturalism is uh, problematic, but also why uh, it, we, have, we have to bear our share of the responsibility for its, its creation. Um, I think we have to be really clear about what we're talking about. There's a certain ironic, uh, a kind of appropriate thing that happens when we talk about multiculturalism, which is that we all sit in the room and have a very different notion of what multiculturalism means. And as the Aidan Burley incident demonstrated rather ably, uh, that different understanding of what multiculturalism is uh, leads us to a position where those who criticise it um, are often uh, derided as being racist or being deeply prejudiced against people on the basis of their colour and their ethnicity. And I don't call into question the sincerity of those who scream racist every time that I say that I disapprove of multiculturalism. Um, it's not their sincerity that's in question, it's our differing understandings of what the hell I'm talking about. So I'm going to be trying to be very clear. Um, I agree with Rania that the problem, the primary problem with multiculturalism has been its uh, envelopment into the state and into the way in which state and public services interact with individuals, families and communities. Uh, what we have done in this country is to effectively encourage the trade unionisation of different ethnicities. We've encouraged people to regard themselves as primarily belonging in terms of their negotiations over resources and over rights to uh, ethnically and racially based uh, communities. And that those communities then must have leaders who take their case uh, to the, the government or the local authority or the housing association and put their case forward. And then uh, decisions are made about the allocation of resources or the allocation of rights on the basis of those competing claims. That strikes me as fundamentally unhealthy in a society which, uh, uh, in an ideal world, would be diverse, but in a reality, an increasing reality, is disparate. It is unhealthy to encourage people to uh, uh, regard themselves as being primarily a member of an ethnic or racial group. It's also led us to a, uh, 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 as a society, a misapprehension about race that is fundamentally problematic, and I would agree with Rani's uh, sentiments, actually really rather racist, uh, which is the idea that race and culture are somehow inseparable. The idea that there is something that uh, exists in uh, the children of Afro-Caribbean immigrants that means that they just must be a little bit more homophobic, or the idea that there's something in uh, being an Indian Sikh that means that those women must be a little bit more subservient or that there's something about being an Arab Muslim that makes you a little bit more censorious. There is nothing in the genetic code or the DNA of any of us that means that we are predetermined to a particular set of cultural views and cultural attributes and I think there's something profoundly worrying about a society which attempts to convince its members that there is. Um, there is a question about why we as a society have embraced such an odd, illiberal notion of what it means to be a member of this society. Um, I'm a conservative. I think all bad things started in the 60s. Um, and I think we have a, a, a problem as a society, which is a historic problem. At the time when my parents and my uh, hippo grandparents were abandoning the notion of the primacy of tradition, were deciding instead that they had 
an entitlement to, uh, to use the phrases of the day, to find themselves. Uh, we also opened our borders for the first real time to uh, mass immigration. And it becomes very difficult if you have collectively, you know, whilst making a <coughs> university law, decided to abandon the primacy of tradition, decided that there is no claim from history and the unique history of the country and the society in which you live uh, on your behaviour and on your morality, it's very hard to then suddenly announce to somebody that, oh no, but you do have to start respecting it because you're brown. And it would be wrong to do that because that would be discriminatory. But the abandonment of our engagement with our own tradition and our confidence in our own tradition has meant that we have had a particular problem in this country uh, when it comes to identifying what it would even mean to integrate people into our society, into our norms, and into our uh, broad moral constructs and, and codes. And that's very problematic. There is a, a secondary factor here, which I'm going to touch on before uh, ducking underneath the table, and you will tell me why I'm, why I'm completely wrong about this, which is that uh, what we have seen that is particular, perhaps, to uh, the question of multiculturalism and Islam has been a slight and subtle but nonetheless quite pernicious change to the demands that are made. As I say, I think we've been unable as a society generally to explain why it might be acceptable for us to impose a broad set of traditions on people who come and live here. But in the case of Islam, in the case of some, not all, uh, Muslim immigrants and uh, their children and their communities, we're not facing anymore a demand that people be allowed to get on with it. We're facing a different demand, something you might term reverse integration, a demand that we fundamentally change the norms and traditions of our society in order to accommodate, and that we all be bound by a set of rules that, whilst not ours, do belong to some uh, recent uh, arrivals. The Rushdie case was the first significant instance of this, and actually when we talk about debates about censorship, I think that's where we get to the nub of this. The idea that we would change a tradition of free speech in order to avoid offending the particularism of a set of cultural sensitivities uh, is not any longer about asking people to be left alone to get on with it, it's about asking all of us to change our norms and traditions to fit in with recent arrivals. Um, I'm going to shut up now because I've had a little note that tells me to. But uh, I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right, I've got some questions for, for, for the panelists. Just, just one question for each, each of the panelists. And, um, uh, and then they may want to sort of come back on that and make some statements and, and comments to each um, uh, other. Then we'll go out to the floor. So please be thinking of your um, questions and, and, and points. Um, Rania. Okay. You took up this um, point about non-judgmentalism. Yes. Uh, can I push you on what level uh, you're referring to non-judgmentalism? Because I worry about a judgmental state. So, so are we talking about individuals, communities? Are we talking about the state? Oh, what level are we challenging? I'm thinking on? mostly in terms of the uh, institutional and organisational judgmentalism. Um, whereby you, I, I'll give you a little example. For instance, um, I, I was at a, a, a junior school in, in a bar in London, in England, uh, and I was, um, I was doing a project, a research project, and a lot of the little girls uh, obviously came from Muslim background and wearing scarves. Now, the girls were about eight years old. I disapprove of eight year old girls wearing head scarves because I think it's, uh, it's actually sexualization of children. It's no different to making them wear, you know, tank tops or whatever. Uh, there's an issue about that, you know. I, I also support the right of parents, but there's another debate to be had. And I was talking to a group of um, uh, assistant teachers, or actually social workers, and I said to them, how, how do you feel about all these eight-year-old girls wearing headscarves? And they were horrified that I actually asked them the question, uh, because they, 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 they thought they weren't even allowed to even question such a practice. And they said, but it's their culture. And I said, so? Don't you think there's something wrong with eight-year-olds uh, wearing headscarves? No, I don't, I don't want to make them feel that they have to agree with me or disagree. But the issue is they didn't even attempt 
to make a judgment about. They didn't even address the issue. They were having to, to teach all these girls, and they kind of um, censored themselves. It was a sense of self-censorship. Uh, so I think this is uh, where, where, where the, the, the issue of judgmentalism, it, it becomes uh, in, uh, insidious, it becomes individualized, and, um, and I think it stops us even addressing and debating issues. Okay, Ryan, well, thanks, sir. Um, John, I've just got a, a quick question, which is, um, in your presentation, you put uh, you had three steps in your presentation, equal dignity, people are formed by community, and they're entitled to public recognition. I just wonder, is there a tension between one and two and three? So, you know, the commitment to uh, an equal dignity, a, a universalism, and then the belief that people are formed by communities and entitled to public recognition. Is there a tension there at all? Uh, there can always be practical tensions between valid public principles. This is nothing new. This is not particular to multiculturalism. So yes, is the short answer. Um, I mean, one has to work these things out uh, practically in context, in often in case by case settings. So, uh, for example, you know, I agree with what uh, uh, Rani has just said about, about these eight-year-old girls being expected to wear headscarves. Many of us probably agree on that substantive question um, because there you feel that a ill-defined communal norm is being imposed on individuals against, against their will or without their consent. Um, so, so yes, that's an example of, of the sort of, I mean, if, if I had time to talk about Sharia councils, you know, that could get interesting, right? Because that's precisely where these values meet what seems like almost a head-on collision. I don't think that's the case necessarily. But, but one, can, one can say, yes, in principle, um, in English law, it is perfectly permissible for individuals to resolve their disputes privately according to their own chosen norms. That is actually the right that every British citizen has in, in, in English law. Uh, it's actually not a group right, it's an individual right. But substantively, of course, on the ground, there is this great worry, uh, very little serious evidence that's been marshaled, but a great deal of worry that in fact, de facto, there is psychological coercion being applied to women to participate in the Sharia, Sharia Council. I, I mean, I, you know, we need a proper investigation into that. Um, so yes, these things can stand in tension. Nothing particular about multiculturalism in that regard. We have to work these things out on the ground. Okay, and, and people may want to come back on that point about Sharia Councils um, in the uh, questions. Uh, James Martin, um, just in some of your, your wider material, um, you've talked about culturalism. Yeah. Um, could you just talk us through that a little bit? Are you sort of yeah, culturalism. Just, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, logically, there must be a, a, a culturalism when we talk about multiculturalism. So uh, what we unconsciously do, uh, that's what you would see when you trace the, the, the idea of this ideology from the, uh, from the uh, anthropology and so on, is the idea that, that uh, culture you are inextricably bound to your culture. This is the way to see it uh, uh, in, in uh, the origins of culture, culturalism. Um, uh, actually, the very first debate about culture uh, and uh, multiculturalism and universalism came up in 1947 when they were drafting the Human Rights uh, Declaration under Eleanor Roosevelt and the uh, Heskowitz from the uh, uh, American anthropologist uh, uh, objected to the fact that you can talk about universal values because we are all born into a culture and we are inextricably bound to that culture. We cannot transcend it, we cannot, we cannot uh, rebel against it, we are fenced in our culture. This is the way to see it and this is the ideology about culture. Culture, once, some decades ago, meant education, striving for knowledge and so on. Today, when you hear the word um, culture, it's a militant ideology. It has transformed, it has undergone the metabolism. And uh, so culturalism is what I hear you and you are objecting against. But this is in fact the, the idea of culture as a, as a political ideology. Um, thank you. Uh, Max, just, just two very quick things. Sir. You said that your for diversity but against multiculturalism. Um, what if people choose to define themselves culturally? Is that not their 
choice and their diversity. And, and what I'm really worried about is that you all agree. So I, I wonder if you <laughs> no, could... Uh, don't worry. No, yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are. I'm just interested in those trends. Out that. That. <laughs> um, uh, what if people choose to define themselves by their culture? Well, people choose to define themselves in all kinds of different ways, and of course that's up to them. What worries me is that um, I think that if you're going to have uh, true diversity, then you have to understand the diversity within people as well as between them. Um, so I'm a Christian, I'm a conservative, I'm also a homosexual, I was raised by Jews. I, you know, it's kind of a, uh, there's a whole set of identities you might want to, a whole set of mythologies even, you might think, that you want to uh, kind of uh, be able to articulate. And what uh, state-led multiculturalism does is encourages people to reduce themselves, to reduce themselves to a single point of understanding about who they are when it comes to the public sphere. Uh, and I think that's, that's profoundly unhelp unhealthy. Uh, but yeah, if people uh, really, really genuinely, and when given the opportunity to engage in a myriad of different ways, want to say, well, no, I'm none of these other things. All I am is black, or all I am is a Muslim woman, or all I am is, then that is, of course, up to them. But uh, in the same way that you need to uh, say, so the, the other paradox here, I would say, is that if you really believe in dissent, which is linked to discrimination, I do believe in dissent. Um, but in order to dissent, you need a tradition to dissent from. And you need, uh, if we're going to have constructive conversations, that tradition to be completely shared. Uh, so that what we're not <coughs> doing is having completely atomized and individual uh, pathological conversations with ourselves, but having conversations about how we move uh, on and differently, and, and we can debate those things, but we have to have a shared space and a shared tradition to debate them within. Okay, Jonathan just wanted to come back in quickly and then we'll go out to well, Just a very quick observation on this question of choosing identities. Um, the very idea that we choose our ethnic, religious, philosophical, or other identities is itself a particular perspective which is contestable. It's, it's a secular, liberal, individualist idea. Now, if public policy is governed by that kind of idea that we choose all our identities, then let's not kid ourselves that that will amount to a hegemonic imposition of a secular liberal individualism against which some minorities will vigorously protest. Very good, thank you. Okay, so questions, points, observations? Gentlemen, uh, Touched very little on the politics exception in a very broad sense. And it occurs to me that in, I'm oh, sorry, uh, you've touched uh, very little on politics, except in a very raw, uh, but very philosophical sense. And it, it, it occurs to me that multiculturalism in the effect in our society is very much more about practical politics. That the assumed homogeneity <coughs> of these multicultural building blocks in the uh, Lego multiculturalist model um, is something that grants to those who define what cultures are, what the cultural practices to be observed through, throughout these cultural building blocks. That gives great power to those people who define those things. And that is a, that is a political prize. Okay, excellent. Uh, gentlemen, there at the back. Dennis Hayes. I just um, think it just gets I won't even see this much as a, a matter of definition, but I agree with um, the last speaker. I mean, there used to be a, the two senses of identity, two very clear senses. There's one that uh, Max sort of listed, that we're not interested in this past identity, the one that he wants to be born in. And there's a much more interesting sense of the identity, the one that you create for yourself and make yourself. And there's two completely different senses of that. I'd rather be interested in the second one. There's also another, there used to be a distinction between race, between um, racism, which was attached to the state, and it's basically seen as a foreigner as an illegal person, and racial prejudice, which is just your bias, and bias against law, particularly if there's things about lots of cultures that we're comfortable with, agriculture, for instance. Um, but there's, something happened in the 1980s, you have to be aware of. Multi, during the riots of the 1980s, where black and Asian people for the state, right? he did not know how to respond. And he responded by very much just throwing money at the problem, throwing money at ethnic groups. And that was a nice little moment for a long time for academics, institutions, trade unions. They threw it. It wasn't a coherent thing. That's why one's culture is not easily defined. And nobody thought through the consequences of it. It wasn't thought through. Well, the consequences came out in the 2000 riots where Asians turned out against blacks in Antwerp. That's a different situation. And then you suddenly realise what happened. I agree with Ronnie on 
this. What, the, what multiculturalism does, and it's not mitigating disaster, is it turns everybody on it into people who are not just asking for money, which it does, but and they have to present themselves as victims. They have to present themselves as pathetic, trapped in their identity. And it's a, you mean, if you come just anything in London, you know, people will stand up and make claims on the state or whatever community on the basis that they're the victims. And that has changed the whole nature. You can get the secularists arguing they want to be treated as a religious group, right? Because they're, very, they're discriminated against. They haven't got anything that holds them together in common, so they don't believe in God. It's not a problem, but there's nothing that holds them together. So you have to see yourself as a victim. And I think the creation of the victim culture through the incoherence of state in post multiculturalism in all the institutions is a disaster for all of us, right? For every single human being. Because once you see yourself as a victim, you are pathetic and you are trapped in your lost personal ideas. Great. Were there any uh, lady in front of me? Yeah. Um, firstly, I wondered whether um, a lot of the problem with multiculturalism is as much the idea of multiculturalism, and a lot, but whether a lot of the reason that we do tend to bracket people into, you know, oh, you're a Muslim woman, you know, you're from this group, you're from this group, is less a problem with the idea of multiculturalism and more a problem with education about different cultures. So. Um, your example of um, the school teachers who wouldn't question the eight-year-old girls wearing headscarves is perhaps less because they're afraid to question multiculturalism and more because they're insufficiently educated about Muslim culture that they didn't realise that this is something that could be questioned, that isn't intricately bound up in Muslim culture because we don't have enough education to understand the subtleties of multiculturalism. And that's not a problem with multiculturalism itself. It's more our failure to understand those multicultures. Um, and secondly, I want to pick up on the victim point because although I definitely see your point that um, we kind of we make it sound like you're from an ethnic minority, therefore you can't look after yourself and we have to help you. Um, but simply making that point does, to an extent, overlook the fact that there may be a problem, and that although ethnic minorities aren't completely victims, if you say, oh. Um, multiculturalism turns them into victims, that, it, that almost ignores the fact that there is racism and there are certain difficulties for certain racial groups. So don't you think that we ought to consider those as well? Okay. Um, <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Josephine. I've started an organization called Good Girls Married Doctors. And uh, it's, about, <laughs> it's about issues, uh, we represent like uh, immigrant minorities, uh, young women who are dealing with domestic violence within their own families. So it's usually intergenerational domestic violence with their parents. And it's like, usually it's because they're too Western or they're like choosing things that their parents don't find. It's like their culture. And it's, it's very much about what this debate's about. Um, what I want to, so I want to mention that issue and that I echo the sentiment. And as I'm gathering different women and I'm thought, like we have, we're building an anthology of women going through these issues, it's like, I want to echo the sentiment of Rania, is that there's, um, it's an issue of boxing different cultures and thinking that this is what you're supposed to be, that you're supposed to be a good Muslim woman or a good Chinese American or something like whatever that culture is. And these, these immigrant children are trying to define themselves like, okay, am I British or am I, am I Muslim or what, like, how, does this, how do I define myself? And like, these people going through this path of identity it's a really interesting struggle. Um, but yes, I do want to issue this point of, I think while Max, you, like, you make a really important point about separating race and culture. And I, and I really like to think of this issue of separating race and culture. So I am racially Chinese origin, but culturally I'm Canadian, British, or wherever I'm living at the moment. <laughs> but um, this issue that um, there is a there there is a, a sort of racialized violence between minority groups in the sense that they have to define themselves and have to create a different norm compared to what they in the society that they're living in. And while and there's this whole thing about yes, there needs to be like the natives and having a claim to their history and elements, but at the same time, like if people want to choose to be able to be comfortable in doing something a little bit different, do we not give them space to be able to, to do this something different? Very good, thank you. Um, there's a gentleman at the back. Uh, hello there. Uh, before coming to London to study, uh, I used to work in high school, Bill Hill, to the Peace Park. 
the GP surgery. Uh, in this GP surgery, there are about 60 different languages of uh, quite a humongous amount of ethnicities. And it's, it's quite interesting how multiculturalism seems to be only in, in this discussion. Uh, so we're only sort of talking one, you know, only one minority at a time. That I think there isn't really a, a lack of appreciation. I think there's a lack of appreciation that when you get like 10 or 20 minorities in a, in a space, and you've got this this uh, segregation, this sort of boxing in, you know, and I think I definitely agree with those sentiments. That the people sort of there isn't much, you know, communication between minorities at this point. And I think that that, that sort of exclusivity. I think that the fact we put people into boxes and we've sort of lost that. I mean, one of the amazing things about British culture that I feel we've lost is people can identify themselves as British. Regardless of what race they were, I, I, I kind of feels like when that example over there about uh, Asian uh, people uh, they, they sort of protesting another ethnicity, I think that happens a lot. I mean, you uh, you have this established Asian uh, community, and you have this influx of Eastern European uh, migrants coming, uh, and you uh, find that. The Asians obviously have uh, uh, come to own property and they've moved to other places, they keep that property and they sometimes have interesting practices in regards to those Eastern European immigrants. So I feel like we, we constantly talk about the majority and the minority and really it's, it's, we have minorities interacting with other minorities and that majority <coughs> with that minority. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got a lot on the table. Um, we've got the uh, practical politics of multiculturalism. We've had questions relating to uh, the consequences of the state promoting uh, difference. We've had uh, points made around identity and the origins of uh, multi uh, multicultural uh, moments and a number of questions around boxing people up and the way that minorities interact uh, with minorities, but what I would particularly like the speakers to come back on is um, Jonathan's point, uh, which is that the culture that the three of you appear perhaps to be advocating is itself uh, liberalism, is itself a culture. Uh, and you know, where do we go from there? Not everybody subscribes to that culture. Uh, there is uh, in society people who define themselves in alternative ways to liberalism uh, and we have to account for that reality or we'll have strife. So Rana, did you want to come back on yeah, that? Yeah, I'll come back on the issue of uh, the secular culture. Um, obviously I'm wearing a headscarf, okay, I'm wearing a body. I'm a Muslim woman. I'm also Lebanese, which means that genetically I am, um, I'm sorry, I can't help it's my genes. I have to drive fast, enjoy fabulous food and always look uh, in, 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 Stunningly stylish, <laughs> which I can't help. I'm sorry. So I have no problem. By the way, I would disagree with Jean Martin and Max here. I have no problem as a Muslim in demanding. I have a right to demand uh, that my local swimming pool might have women's only hours, so I can go swimming. Uh, my local swimming pool can refuse me that. That's not a problem. But I, you know, and actually, my local swimming pool does have women only, but nothing to do with Muslim women. To do with women who want to swim separately. So, in, on, a, on an individual level in terms of identity, I think it's fine. I'm not denying individual identities, and I think maybe some of it is inherited. Oh, by the way, my mother does not dress as I am. My mother is actually quite westernized. So that's, that's another story. And just to trump Max on this, I was brought up in a Catholic convent. So there you go. <laughs> so, so in a way, I think identity is... the very is, best education possible. Uh, it was Lebanese Catholic convent, yeah. of course, of course. So obviously, identity and what we choose is very personal. And I, I believe, this is the, li the libertarian me, in the absolute right of individuals to do that. And if they wish so, to get together as groups in civil society and make demands. It doesn't mean society as a whole has to acquiesce to the demands, but we have to have the liberty of having this debate and this discussion. And I think this idea, this kind of, um, I don't know, the, the idea that somehow if... Um, a group does come together, whether it's 
you know, people who are, I don't know, uh, gay and lesbian and uh, transgendered, or whether they are Muslims, or whether they are, I don't know, vegetarians, that could get together and actually engage civic, in a civic way in, in that identity, that's fine. I do not want to ban them. I want to engage with them. But I want to uh, bring in um, the issue of victim women, and, and actually uh, Guy's point about the, the practical politics. The practical politics has been a support, and I think Dennis mentioned that, the support of groups that identify themselves without actually that these groups having any democratic uh, um, reason for existing. For instance, they all, everyone talks about the Muslim community. Give me a break. There's no such thing as, a, I mean, maybe there is a Christian community. <laughs> Uh, Muslims are as varied as anything, and you have all of the Muslims from the burqa wearing to the, the bikini wearing, you know. Uh, it, it, and, and yet, we had in the New Labour era, even before, before that, this identification of completely self appointed, usually male individuals, who somehow became speakers for the Muslim community, and money flowed into that. And that, that further racialized the issues and created this kind of deep divisions where the people say, oh, Muslims are demanding this. And, Muslims are. So I think this is what the practical point, and it's not just Muslims. I mean, uh, in, the, in the field of education, there's something called, the, I don't want to, they're probably going to come back and, and uh, ostracize me, the network for black professionals. As if everybody, you know, who is a minority, and by the way, I do not consider, my, I do, I do not consider myself a minority. I may be unique, but I'm not a minority. <laughs> so, so, you know, they, they're getting so much money and funding. And it can, to me, the question is why racialize these issues when actually I don't think they are dealing with any of the problems. I'm just going to work quickly. Race and culture, what an interesting point. Yes, um, I am not an immigrant. I actually uh, bestowed my presence on this country 30 years ago. So, uh, but I, <laughs> okay, uh -huh. so uh, I, I, you know, this is, this is very complex, but again, reducing it. And I, I'm afraid I do disagree with you about education because we, we can't know enough and there are different constructions on what is it to be a Muslim. What I didn't want to ban little girls from wearing headscarves. What I wanted to do is engage in the debate about it. And this is what I worry. The idea of shutting people down, shutting people up and saying either we don't know enough or we don't want to cause offence or you know what, you're all awful, we don't want to listen to you. Let's engage in the debate. This is my point. Okay, Mohamed, well, thank you very much for that. Um, just a thought, please don't come back <laughs> straight away, but let's, let, we'll come back to it, which is, are you saying that people's identities are generated by the state? Because that would seem to put people in a position of passivity, um, and maybe not to acknowledge something that's real and in the outside world, not just simply a reflex of the state. Um, I wonder whether we can come back on that in the discussion. So, Mac, did you want to... Um, well, I'm, I, I'm not a secularist. I'm, I'm flattered to be called a liberal. It's, it's unusual uh, <laughs> that I experience such, uh, such high praise. Um, so I, th I think it, it, it's not that I want to um, replace our public sphere with a French public sphere, right? So I don't want to replace it with a hyper-secular um, uh, obsession with driving out conscience and faith and religion from debate and discussion. I, am, I absolutely don't want to do that. What it is that I believe is that we have uh, a right, a right that we probably missed at the time when it would have been uh, useful and reasonable and more acceptable to exercise it, which is to avoid the presumption of accommodation. So there is, uh, in our uh, public life, a presumption that the demand which Rania is absolutely entitled to make as a Muslim woman, that you know, I want to be able to go and swim in a women-only pool, um, uh, she's absolutely entitled to make that demand. We are entitled to say no, and to say no for explicit reasons of our own norms. And we're entitled as a society to say, well, that's not how things are done here, I am afraid. Um, what I worry about is the fact that we gave up on doing that. And because we gave up on doing that, we uh, find it almost impossible to justify uh, saying no to requests for accommodation uh, explicitly on the basis that we have a different tradition, a tradition which uh, has evolved and, and developed in this country and in our society for a very long time, and that that tradition is not so cheap and not so rubbish and not so unjustifiable as to be so easily thrown away. Um, which leads us on to the practical 
consequences of multiculturalism. One of the things I think that has been a devastating impact of culture, multiculturalism and will in the end probably prove its death as an idea is the way in which it has excluded people who don't have a particular or a particularly obvious minority identity to cling to. Um, you know, it is exceptionally offensive that when we talk in the terms of multiculturalism and we talk about the black community and the Muslim community, we then talk about white working class people. As though uh, for white British people, the identity that they're allowed to cling to is an economic one, it's a class-based one. And for everybody else, the identity that they ought to cling to is some strange hybrid of ethnicity and religion which is somehow not available to us. Now, I don't particularly want to live in a country where white people are encouraged to believe that they are uh, a community of white folk. But there is just a fundamental unfairness in a discussion from which vast numbers of people are effectively excluded. And it has been the case in conversations around multiculturalism that the only people who are allowed to bring the only relevant identity to the table, because the only relevant identity is reduced to being this kind of hybrid cultural, racial uh, uh, identity that, that, that people have, um, white people have been excluded from that conversation, unless they happen to be poor enough that we can class them as white working class or chads or whatever it is that you want to call them. And that is fundamentally problematic and I think points to the problem that we're all going to have to decide what side we're on. So if you're prepared to sit there and say that I believe there should be something called the White Professionals Network and the White Police Officers Association, then fine, you're a true multiculturalist and we'll all uh, uh, run along and get on with identifying ourselves by uh, our, our DNA. If, however, you find that fundamentally a quite uncomfortable proposition, I think you have to ask yourself very seriously and very uh, uh, difficult question about why you think Southall Black Sisters, for instance, should be entitled to money from the state. Okay, thank you, Max. There is an obvious comeback, which is the question of power and who has power in society. But, um, John. Well, you just stole my thunder. That's exactly the response. I mean, that's, that, that's, first of all, I, I do recognise, as valid, the claim that there are certain sections of the so-called white working class in urban centres in the UK, London, Bradford, other places like that, who have justified grievances against uh, about being marginalised. Uh, no question about that. Um, you know, if you go to Bradford, that's, that's a major factor behind the, the Bradford riots in, in 2000, among other things. So I'm not dismissing that at all, but I, I you know, I, I think one has to caution before making the case too strongly that uh, you know, white people in Britain are somehow being marginalised. I mean, this, if you're a member of an ethnic minority, this does not wash very well, frankly, in most places. Uh, it, it, it's a sort of rather pedantic captious point, which I think does not bear uh, up to scrutiny on, on, on the ground. Um, so, you know, I, I think that can be over eggs, frankly. So, no, I'm not lobbying for an association of you know, white, white Christian professionals or whatever else it might be, because there's no need for that. Um, you know, th there's only a need for organization, and certainly only a need for any public recognition, where there is some sort of substantive complaint or grievance or, or, or injustice. And where those exist, it's perfectly entitled, as, as Rania said, for people to organize in civil society to present their claims uh, for, for public protection or recognition or funding, whatever that may be to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. And these generalized, I mean, here I think we have to avoid as far as possible generalized affirmations or dismissals of segregation, victimization, multiculturalism, uh, essentialization. I mean, one has to be much more nuanced about this. These generalized rhetorical ploys actually end up being quite discursively misleading and discursively disrespectful to a number of ethnic and religious I know. So let's temper our language. Let's talk much more on case by case basis. Just to add one quick comment. Sadly, from Toby's point of view, I think the entire panel agrees in, in rejecting the notion of um, you know, essential identities. We're all opposed to the essentializing or fossilizing or freezing of identities. Identities are porous, are hybrid, are in flux. And, and it's important to note that you know, human beings in many cultures uh, have the capacity to carry with them multiple affiliations of multiple identities. And so multiculturalism is not saying, at least any credible form of multiculturalism, is not saying 
We must elevate this particular identity, whether it's ethnic, religious, or whatever, or racial, above all the others and define people solely in those terms. That, I mean, I'm not sure that anybody has actually ever said that, even though that might be how it comes across sometimes in, in, in public discussion. You know, we have multiple affiliations. We have to, we have to negotiate within ourselves those multiple affiliations. And society and the state has to take cognizance of those affiliations insofar as citizens wish to present them in, in public. Certainly the state's business is not to create identities, and indeed I think that claim is also overstated. I mean, uh, you know, certainly state policy and funding policies can skew identities. Certainly it can play into inappropriate distributions of power <coughs> within ethnic minority community. All of that's true. But the state doesn't create, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of any instance where state policy has created any identity. There's something excellent there already, in some form or other, some degree of stability, before it ever gets to be presented in, in public. Thanks. Do you want to come back on that? Well, I mean, I, I, I take your point that, uh, that lots of white people have lots of power, and lots of white straight people have lots of power. You know, I, I, I'm not for a second suggesting that uh, and I, I, would, I would really genuinely hate it for people to think that I'm suggesting that somehow there's some kind of uh, inherent problem in, in British society now and, and white people are being mistreated on the whole and being uh, subjugated. I do, however, think that if you're going to encourage people, as I believe that the state has done, to present themselves in, when it comes to calls for funding or calls for changes to the way public services operate or calls for resources around housing, you know, encourage people to present themselves as being members of particular types of group which have particular typologies of victimhood and therefore have particular sets of entitlements in the name of fairness. That when you uh, exclude from that uh, large numbers of people who are not able to uh, acquire to themselves such identities, you're asking for trouble, right? And, and I think if you look at um, the way in which organisations such as the EDL talk about themselves and describe themselves. There's two interesting things going on, one of which the Martin is much better to uh, a quick talk about than I am. One is their appeal to enlightenment values, right? So one is that the organisations like the EDL and many of the people who uh, voted for a minaret ban in Switzerland talk about is their appeal to kind of what they thought was the fundamental uh, kind of fairness proposition that the states in which they live have. Um, and the other is an expression of deep angst about the fact that when, uh, for instance, Luton decides to have its celebration of multiculturalism, which it does every year in a kind of strange, uh, it, it's, it's not a thing, um, but the, the, there is a section of the community which is uh, by predisposition excluded from being celebrated because what is being celebrated is the fact that there are people that are different to them. And that's how that is felt by many people in Bradford, in Luton, etc. And so whether or not you think it's overblown is, is to me slightly beside the point. Because it's the felt reality for those people. Uh, it's, it's becoming an entrenched part of their identity. And uh, it is, it, at least on the rhetorical ground, you know, I'm sorry if you think I'm being too rhetorical, but it is a debate. Um, but at least on the rhetorical grounds, it is something which... Uh, they feel is linked to our kind of meta-narrative about this and our, and, our, and our kind of policy interventions and the way in which we gear our culture. And that's a problem. Well, at least I think it is. Okay. Uh, which brings us to the interesting question of tolerance. Tolerance, tolerance. yeah. Uh, just to the question of whether or not the state uh, promotes an identity at this discussion, this of homogenous culturalism, this is of course not... Uh, um, it's uh, not so interesting, it's more interesting to see if the public discourse promotes an identity. Because even in the public discourse, which means the rules, the unwritten rules uh, for what you're allowed to say and not being stigmatised and, uh, and still be considered as the same person and so on, uh, this, the discourse are the framework for the way we can discuss and think and prohibit our th ourselves to think about certain issues uh, because it, it's permeating all sorts of uh, in our mind. This is what, that, that's the reason why I found this, uh, this topic with the, the referendum in Switzerland very interesting as a model topic for discussing how multiculturalism is discussed in Europe. 
in this very, not very straight way, because there are many problems with the public discourse, because people do not really know what they are allowed to say, and journalists think too much. They just have to write what they have to write. So what happened in Switzerland when this uh, issue, this referendum took place, it was promoted by a right-wing populist party called Schweizer Forstpartei, and this was the uh, nobody, the maximum something like like ten percent support this party in Switzerland. But the uh, they before the referendum, everybody said, "Oh no, it will fall." I mean, uh, and the, the poll said, "No, no, it will it will fall." On the very day, alone. They, uh, the, the Swiss people voted more than 50, 55%. They were 20% wrong in the polls. So they got all the answers they wanted to get in the media. And after that, that's good for you. They, after that, they criticized themselves by asking. They sent people up in the mountains and talked to people in the cities. Why did you lie to us? Why did you lie to us? We didn't get value for our money. We paid a lot for these polls. We didn't get right answers. And then the conservative people, the farmers on the mountain said, well, there are, no, there are no Muslims here. We supported the referendum anyway, this uh, prohibition of minerals. But we, we know that there are Muslims down in Geneva, and they, they, they live by themselves, and they're creating their own nation in Switzerland, and we don't like that. At least, if it's not the truth, it's the way people see it, okay? They ask people, liberal people in the big cities, in Lausanne and in Geneva, why did you lie? Why did you vote for this uh, uh, prohibition? Well, uh, we didn't want to get, be associated with this slice of the party. So, but anyway, we voted for it anyway because we want to protest against all these taboo subjects that are not discussed in public and that are not allowed to be discussed. And they mentioned the bigotry against homosexuals and so on. And they also mentioned the fact that, which sort of is connected to the, the point of view the, the, the conservative have, that people from the minority don't outmarry their own community and marry into the majority community and vice versa. And what is the reason for that? Isn't that a big, isn't that a big problem in a, a segregationist problem in a democracy and in a, when we believe in egalitarian uh, 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 ideas? Uh, and uh, we have a kind of segregationist society where people don't or are not allowed to or are brought up in a way so they, the result is that there is no outmarrying from the, from the different group into other groups. Okay. Uh, so this was just to say something about the public discourse, not yeah, the state. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so I'd like to go out to the floor and get everybody in, but so if people could keep their comments and questions as brief as possible, that would be fantastic so that we can include everyone. Okay, um, so who'd like to go? Yeah. I'm terrible with the mics. Um, should I stand up or? Yeah, stand up. Yeah, yeah. Up to you, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I'll try to be in slightly. Now I've been dated on the nurse right in front of me, so I'm ashamed. Max. Sorry, man. Um, you were talking about the doing it. Yeah, sorry. Um, it was mentioned before, and um, I just want to talk about how it's slightly come up now this white working class hostility. Um, coming off council estate myself, um, I'm a stepdad being a bit of a mum working in a supermarket. Um, even I live in Shrewsbury, and it's, it's so obvious it's there because there's a sense of um, special treatment that's going out to other people. You talk about Sharia courts, and um, judges don't seem to understand they make very what they think are very liberal judgments to certain individuals, but fall at the fact that people demand true liberalism, which is equality before the law. If you live in an area where your kids, if you're poor, you will go to the worst school. And if that's in somewhere like Bradford, it means you'll go to the worst school where maybe four or five different languages are spoken. Um, Really, it's just a sense of, I think we're almost lucky in this country that we have people as incompetent as Nick Griffin, because the hostility, <laughs> the, the sense of almost being a persecuted minority, where what your culture is, is almost erased, and there's no expectation of integration. People are allowed to have their different culture. No one minds the fact that it may be that someone speaking four or five languages, or 
neither um, council estates go or council housing goes by need and not you pay your children wait in. The people who get houses are the people who have most children. Okay. People who have most children are culturally from that. So it's just a quick point about okay. working class possibility. Okay, there's a, a lady in front here. Hi there. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Chaplin in that there should be a more discriminatory definition of multiculturalism, but also in some ways with, with Max in that we choose our identity and that the problem lies in the envelopment of multiculturalism into the state. I'm a 29-year-old Scottish Pakistani woman who spent only two weeks of her entire life in Pakistan when I was 11 and who's lived in London for the past nine years, which in itself is interesting given the recent agreement for a referendum, and who's had to pick and choose what elements of cultural identity I choose to adopt. Now, I don't want to skirt around the issue. I do believe it's our twisted ideas of, of multiculturalism that have allowed honour killings, honour-based violence and forced marriages to happen. Um, I'd also like to propose that multiculturalism should mean a willingness to understand other ideas of culture and identity, not to absorb their way of life into our own, and that the debate should centre around how best to assist those whose lives are in danger or who are being denied the right to make the same choices available to everyone else in this country. Great, thank you very much. Now, there's a couple of people at the back. Uh, yeah, so, two there. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to question the idea of um, traditional norms, the British traditional norms that apparently are fixed in society. I would really challenge that because you acknowledge yourself that there was an evolution and a struggle to get to the point we are now. So, therefore, we're not trajectory. It's, it's subject to change and kind of debate. And we've already seen, taking your example of freedom of speech, there is a current crisis because of developments in social media. Well, what are we going to do about freedom of speech on Twitter? It hasn't worked. People are going to prison because of the so-called freedom of speech. So I just want to question that. There are other influences on um, how uh, the norms of society are changed. But on a positive note, that this is an opportunity for us to come together, all, all the diversity of society, and then discuss how, and as a total, how we can overcome them. Okay, that's an interesting sort of optimistic take, which might be an interesting uh, one to end on. But okay, last question there, please. Yeah, I'm talking as an experienced teacher who's had the pleasure of working in classrooms where no two students have been from the same culture. And it's, um, it's truly amazing and beautiful. And I would like to propose that multiculturalism is actually the ideal setting for enhancing the life chances of young people, particularly young women and girls. And I find that for two reasons. Firstly, in a multicultural setting, young people are exposed to that hybridity which was discussed by the gentleman on the left, sorry I don't know your name, but a true multicultural society presents plurality within cultures and different interpretations of cultures and therefore gives young people the space to interpret their own culture and create something new within it. That's my first point. Okay, I'm afraid I'm about to cut you off. Sorry, but that, that's an important point. Okay, yeah. uh, so I'm going to bring the panel back in now. They're, they're under strict instructions to uh, uh, only speak for one minute, Max. Um, okay, uh, the question of tradition. I'm not suggesting for a second that tradition is a fixed thing, although I think ironically, in our abandonment of our own evolving tradition, um, we have ascribed fixed traditions to minorities living in our society. Um, so we, it's a continuum, it's a conversation, but it's one that we did, I believe, give up have, having uh, uh, during the, the, the 60s, and we got very bad at having it, got very bad at engaging with where our own norms have come from and where our own traditions have evolved from. And at the same time, uh, we uh, allowed the impression to be created by some of the self-appointed community leaders that Ryan was talking about earlier, that there are uh, yet yeah, fixed traditions for people of particular ethnicities or cultures. And it's that kind of uh, paradox which has been hugely problematic in terms of our ability to affirm things about who we are, uh, to accommodate and integrate people who come to this country, and, in, and to create a society in which people at least feel, to echo the point that was made over there, like there is a, a sense of kind of common moral fairness. Okay, thank you very much. Jen? A few, a few words about, uh, about the word still. Multiculturalism. I think there's nothing wrong in the word in the, in the, in the multi. It's the culturalism that's the problem. Uh, because uh, th this this idea that culture has now become an argument. I still stick to the the, the discourse about multiculturalism. The, the fact that that culture now has been an argument is now an argument 
for something, for a special privilege, or anything else, or for, for a point of view that say you can you can blame me. We had the Rusty affair, we had the Danish cartoons affair, now we have the silly movie coming from in, uh, from America. Uh, you can always find something. I mean, there's always something on the internet you can use sort of uh, It's not, and, and therefore, there, there was this metaphor, we are called in language, we are called in the metaphor, spark and fire metaphor, which means that everything is a spark to the fire in the Middle East. It's not so. It's very difficult to erase a, a, a thing like the uh, animosity against the Danish cartoons and also probably before that against the Rusty. And all these are campaigns are meticulously fabricated. So, end of this argument is that culture is not an argument. Okay, thank you very much. John? I just want to end on some reflections about um, national values. Um, who are we? And uh, what is our tradition? What does that amount to? There is a huge debate to be had, which has barely started, on, on what those terms mean. Uh, and it's a very difficult debate. Um, it underpins, I think, a lot of these, these tensions over multiculturalism. So, one of the reasons why multiculturalism is so difficult to handle today is not just because of increasing immigration of you know, non British cultures, but because British culture itself has undergone massive transformation, erosion, and internal conflict. So at one time, until roughly, let's say, the 1950s, British culture was identified, perhaps you should even say English culture, you know, you can't speak English, English not written. English culture was characterized, dominated by a, a hybrid of uh, Judeo-Christian values and Enlightenment values. Those are the two front lines, and the debates about the future of the nation with essentially arguments between those those two. Both sides of those poles have now largely collapsed or are under serious in, in serious retreat. This is long before immigration arrived in the 1960s. So it's very difficult to talk about England or Britain and identify a, a clear set of shared national values that characterize those communities. Don't blame ethnic minorities for that. We imploded that ourselves. And unless we can begin to get a bit of clarity again about what basic values might unite us, what the shared obligations of citizenship might be, these debates are going to be increasingly difficult and increasingly fraught. Okay, thank you very much for that, Charlotte. I think I've got probably less than a minute because I can see the clock. Okay, uh, just to say that uh, to show that we're not all in agreement, that has got a bit warning really for colleagues on the panel. Uh, to Max, Max, you're in danger of the Freud in identity envy. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, don't go there. Uh, I agree with, uh, I do agree with Jonathan. What is this we, as in the, the adult, who is this we they face? Uh, basically, the, 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 the we is, 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 a, is a fragmented identity, is different identities. Uh, I, I, I've got uh, in-laws who are English. I can tell you that uh, friends, my, my English friends live in Park Lane. I have different norms of values to my English friends who live on certain estates in Derby. So uh, uh, there, are, there are lots of issues around there. There is also, you know, there is lots of fallacies. Be careful with the fallacies. I've heard a few fallacies being repeated here today. Um, let's have a discussion, but let's say when something is a fallacy, it's a fallacy. Uh, yes, some people might ask for special privileges. They're not just ethnic minorities. Also, people might want special special privileges. This is what we need as a society to debate and discuss. And on the last point on multiculturalism, we are multicultural. I'll say to all of you and my colleagues on the, on the panel, next time you're talking to a lovely dish of hummus of tabbouleh, remember it's the Lebanese you have to thank for this moment. Okay, right. Um, uh, we haven't resolved issues. Uh, we've got a whole series of uh, controversies running throughout the day here, including racism, uh, alignment and kicking, and topping it all, genocide denial. Um, at four o'clock in this room. Can we thank our speakers, please?